So I'm glad you're here. Um, would you turn to the second chapter of Acts, where we'll begin today? And uh, <clears throat> we will try to cover, I will try to cover with you, the first 13 verses. No guarantee that we'll make it that far, but we will be focusing on the first four. Uh, you know how Luke can say so much in so little, so few words, cover profound events and reduce them down to succinct statements. We have that in these first four verses, as we have in the introduction both to Luke and to Acts. So let's pray and ask God's blessing. Father, we do need the help of your spirit, uh, both in teaching, as I do, and in understanding, as I pray for the class, uh, as we approach a very significant passage of scripture, a very significant event in redemptive history. So help us to gain a better grasp of what is happening and not to just go over words quickly. Uh, so bless the class. Uh, may you receive glory. May truth be taught. We pray in Christ's name. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. We are in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, and as time permits, we'll look at verses 5 through 13. Luke says, when the day of Pentecost arrived, some of your versions will say, had fully come, I think, which is a better translation. That's what the word means. It's it's the word in Greek, sum pleirao. Pleirao means to fulfill, full. But you add sum with it, which normally means with. If you put those two together, and we've seen before, it intensifies it. So what he's saying is, when the day of Pentecost completely arrived, and it's in the imperfect, so it kind of stretches it out in time. Why say that? Just stop for a minute and think, this is a momentous day that had been foretold by the prophets. Remember Joel? The, the time will come when, uh, the day of the Lord, when your old men will see visions and, and your young men dream dreams or whatever. Uh, when I'll pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. So it all in the Old Testament, there's this looking forward to the coming of the Spirit and to the involvement of not only Jews, but Gentiles. And you remember Jesus saying, as quoted by John the Baptist, I will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire, telling them to wait until they receive power from on high when the Spirit comes on. So uh, prophecies looking toward this day, toward this event, because something monumental is happening. Now, you recall that in the first part of, of Acts, which we spent some time looking at, uh, Luke covered the time from, first of all, the time from the resurrection of Christ to the ascension of Christ to the period of time between the Ascension and Pentecost, which is 10 days, in all 40 days. Uh, and gives us in, in detail what's going to happen, what did happen. He emphasizes that in the time of the preaching of the gospel, uh, it will be a preaching of the kingdom of God, the resurrection of Christ, and the empowerment of the Spirit. Here is where it started. We've talked about the fact that you have the ministry of Christ three years. Christ is in the body and he's preparing his disciples for this coming of the kingdom in this dimension. 
and the church and, and the propagation of the gospel. And he tells them, remember, it is to your advantage that I go away. Because if I don't go away, the Holy Spirit will not come. So you get the idea, the coming of the Spirit is advantageous, more advantageous than if Jesus had remained in the flesh. So you see what's all summed up in the way Luke puts that, when the day of Pentecost had arrived. Like Luke saying, now, at last, it has finally come. That's the sense, I think, of this meeting. So when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. That's verse 1. Uh, some of the commentators suggest that the all here um, is more than just the 120 that we saw in the first chapter. We don't know. But it is entirely possible that in the interim, and I don't know how much of a time we have, we have 10 days between the time of the Ascension and Pentecost. Uh, somewhere, and, and Luke says, in those days, in that 10-day period, uh, this uh, selection of Matthias that we looked at last week takes place. So we don't know how many days from that point, selection of Matthias, to this day of Pentecost, there are. But it is possible that during that time, many people hear about what's happening and are drawn to uh, this crowd, to this group of people. One person said, I think there were about 400. Well, that's purely speculative. I don't know how many there were. But whoever is there, Luke says, they were all together in one place. Now the one place he discusses in this, or mentions in the second verse, it's a house. It is no longer the upper room. And I'm thinking, well, you can't fit all of those people in the upper room. They must have grown to the point they need a house. Whose house? We don't know. A follower of Christ or just somebody in Jerusalem who rents out a house. Uh, but they were in a house, and they were all together. And verse 2, suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. They were sitting. There's a significance to the fact they were sitting. Because Jews sit to listen to their teacher. Well, you're sitting. But of course, they didn't sit in chairs. They sat on the floor, cross-legged. And oftentimes, and usually, the teacher did too. And that's the teaching posture, to sit. So what we learn is they were not praying. They were anticipating something that involved their listening, you see. Because when Jews prayed normally, although they sometimes prayed kneeling and sometimes prostrate on the ground, they never, as far as I know, prayed sitting. They normally prayed standing. And, you know, the early church then took this up. Uh, they followed the Jewish custom, because, of course, it began in Judaism, and so Christians stood to pray. And then I got to thinking, in our liturgy, how many times we stand to pray. Look at it. You know, we, during the prayer of adoration, we stand. We stand during the uh, prayer of consecration. Contribution is, is taken. Uh, so prayer is a congregational prayer. Normally with us is standing. We don't fully, some people do, assume the posture. That's the posture. Christians in the early days prayed with their hands raised. That's, and Paul has referenced that. Raising holy hands, you know. And that was called the orans. That's the Latin participle for pray. They, that's the praying posture. Uh, so, just a side point. But they were sitting, anticipating something that maybe is going to be said. Now, there are, in these four verses, verse 2, there is a sign. Verse 3, there is a sign. Verse 4, there is that to which the sign points. Signs always point to something. <clears throat> there are some miracles involved here. But in the Bible, anytime you have miracles involved, and it's described in the Bible, it's it, the word sign is used with it. Signs, wonders, and miracles. Because pagans 
had, whether they were real or not, wonders and miracles and spectacles. And the point is, with God's people, it's not just a spectacle, it is pointing to something that God is doing. So we have two signs, and that which, to which the signs point. Well, let's take verse two. The, the, the sign in verse two is a sound like a mighty rushing wind that fills this entire house where they're sitting. And I wonder if it is so audible that that's one reason that you have all these people coming together uh, that we read about in verses five through 13. So the sound comes like, not, not actually a wind, it isn't a wind blowing them over, blowing over the house like a hurricane or a tornado. It is a sound like wind, a sound like a wind. And it is not only a wind, it's a mighty wind and it is a rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Now, what's the point of that? In the Hebrew language, in the Greek language, in the Latin language, not in the English language, the word for wind, and the word for spirit, and the word for breath are all the same word. So for a wind to come, that spirit, for a wind to come, that's mighty breath of God. And so the sign points to the coming of the spirit. Lee, I have a question for you. <laughs> uh, in Arabic, what is the word for wind? Hawa. Hawa. Is that the same word for spirit? No. It isn't. So in Arabic is different. Normally, Arabic is uh, very close. <laughs> That's a different word. But it's ruach. In Hebrew, it's ruach. And I, I, I learned something I hadn't thought about before. James Montgomery Boyce, you all know he was, a uh, great thinker. He says, anytime you, use, you say these words, you are letting out an audible sound like a wind. That is called onomopoeia. In other words, anytime a word imitates a sound. <clears throat> so listen to it in Hebrew. Ruach. You can almost hear the, the wind coming. And he says that's true for the Greek and Latin and also. And I got to think, well, now that's not quite as much a wind as ruach. But in, in Greek, it is periuma. Periuma. So with this pneuma, I have to think, what kind of wind sound is that? That may be the sound of wind coming through the trees, I don't know. Pneuma. In Latin, it is spiritus. Spiritus. And so I got to think, that's the sound of the wind coming around the corner. Spiritus. <laughs> that's just imagine, my imagination. But, but Boyce said it always has this audible sound. It conveys the idea of the spirit coming, and it's mighty, and it's rushing. You remember um, in, in, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, in Genesis, when God created the world, it was without form and void. And the next verse says, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. The Ruach of God moved on the face of the waters. And out of the out of the chaos of that original creation, the Spirit brought order. You see the work of the Spirit to work with what God has created and bring something beautiful and orderly and meaningful out of it. And then we come to the creation of man. And man created, made man God created man in his own image. But then, what did he do? He breathed into <coughs> him. Ruach. He breathed into him the breath of life. And man became a living soul. Uh, Linsky said, apart from the breath of God, man is but dead matter. In order for man to have life, God must breathe some of his life into him. So you see again the idea of God breathing and bringing about something marvelous and wonderful. 
Uh, God is creating the basic elements, so to speak, but it is the spirit that gives form to it and gives meaning to it. And that's the work of the spirit, the third person of the Trinity. Let's come to the New Testament. And there's that interesting dialogue between Jesus and Nicodemus. And Nicodemus came to Jesus by night. And Jesus introduces this whole idea. And he says to Nicodemus, except a man be born from above, he cannot see, that is, understand the kingdom of God. And I'm taking back rushing mighty wind coming from God. It must be born from above. Of course, Nicodemus didn't understand. A man have to enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born again? Jesus said, no, 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 you don't understand. Flesh gives birth to flesh. Spirit gives birth to spirit. I'm talking not about a birth of flesh. I'm talking about a birth of spirit. And he explains in the fifth verse of John chapter 3, Truly I say to you, except a man be born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And he goes on to explain to Nicodemus that the spirit is like the wind, same word. You can't see where it's coming from because you can't see where it's going. You sure feel the effect of it. That's the spirit. So, all through the Bible, we're seeing this God's Spirit bringing to life. And so the idea here, this symbol, this sign that the, of the rushing mighty wind is suggesting God is about to breathe life into the church, into the kingdom, into his plan, his redemptive plan, put form into it, make meaning of it. Um, one other thing about the, about the wind. <clears throat> I'm a friend. I uh, wish I could persuade him to come to church here. <clears throat> um, he was, excuse me, a former student, and uh, he is quite a thinker. Uh, he knows a lot of languages. He knows Hebrew. He knows Arabic. He knows Greek. And uh, he pointed out. That in the Hebrew, all the words are verbals. All words, nouns, adjectives, pronouns, whatever, they are all formed from verbs. All the basic words in Hebrew are verbs. And there are three letters in Hebrew, all of them. Now verbs are, indicate motion, they indicate action. And of course in the Bible, the, act, the actor is God. So, my, my friend pointed out that what we're seeing redemptively throughout the Bible is God moving on people, moving on his people to save them, to bring about his plan of redemption. And that's exactly the symbol we have here, a rushing, mighty wind. This is God rushing upon his people to bring about life. That's all symbolism. But symbols point to something. Now we never must confuse the symbol with the thing it represents, but there is a connection. In, in sacraments, we call it the sacramental union. So, the spirit is the reality toward which the wind points. First sign. Second sign, verse three. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to I was given when I was just a wee little boy, and uh, all the pictures of the fire and the heads of people was always fascinating to me. Uh, the suggestion here from what Luke gives is it's not just the, the, the apostles, but all of the people. The divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. Now, most of the commentators say it, it started out as a, a, a tower, a pillar of fire. Remember when God was guiding the Hebrews through the wilderness at night. You have this uh, smoking fire pot and flaming torch, kind of a, I see a column, a torch-like thing of fire. And so it's, it, this may be the idea that you have this, uh, this cone, this pillar that, that, that appears of fire, and then it just divides up. And parts of it go on all the people and situate themselves Above the heads of the people. Now, this is not literal fire, just like it wasn't a literal wind, physical. As of fire, it looks like fire. 
Now, let's go back again. We're going to ask, what's the symbolism here? Go back to Genesis 15 and that smoking fire pot and flaming torch, because you remember that is when God walked through or went through uh, the sides of the sacrifices. Abraham had positioned on either side of a gully, and, and normally people would walk through it to confirm the covenant. Only God walked through it, and if God, obviously God is confirming the covenant. So let me suggest to you that fire has two symbolic meanings here before we move to two more meanings. I think it has, we'll see four of them in a moment. But there are definitely two things even we can see from Genesis 15, and we can see it as well uh, from uh, Mount Sinai, and that is the fire indicates the presence of God. That smoking fire pot and flaming torch was indicating the presence of God, as sure as it did in guiding them through the wilderness, God's presence. But in this case, in the Genesis 15 case, it is symbolizing the confirmation of the covenant that God made with Abraham. Move to Mount Sinai. Once again, scripture says it was fire and thunder at Mount Sinai. Uh, the writer of Hebrews goes on to say our God is a consuming fire. That symbolized the presence of God, but it symbolized as well the confirming of the covenant with Moses. You see what's going on here? To me, there is a confirming of the covenant that God makes with us through Christ, the covenant that is carried out by the coming of the Spirit, the preaching of the gospel to the uttermost places of the earth, the ministry of the Holy Spirit, presence of God, confirmation of it all in this sign as a fire. Those are two possible uh, matters, meanings in fire. Two more. Hang on. Fire, anytime it occurs, not just in the context of the Bible, because the first two are biblical contexts, but anywhere in fire, it has light, brings light. Um, before we had electricity, we had to light a candle or light a lamp or something. You had a fire that brought light to illuminate the darkness. The illuminating power of the Spirit, you know, even when we preach, when Pastor Jim is going to preach this morning, there will be a prayer. He's going to pray. He's going to stop and pray before he preaches, and that's called the prayer for illumination. Illumination is light. It comes to the word for light. So what he's praying for, what I pray for, what all of us who teach or preach, or any of you who have been through this, you pray that God is going to give you illumination, is going to help you understand. And any of us who teach and preach, if I look back on a lot of years of preaching, I can recognize times the Spirit took over. Uh, and David kind of stepped back out of it. It wasn't I who was speaking. It, and it's not a weird thing. It, it's just, it is a real thing. And Jim, I'm sure, will confirm the same thing. So, illumination. A um, few passages for illumination. Uh, Isaiah 9, 2. The people who walked in darkness, this prophecy, have seen a great light. The peoples. That's a prophecy of the coming of the gospel to the Gentiles in the book of Isaiah. In the form of light. Light becomes a symbol for the coming of the gospel. We have Paul defending himself in Acts 26. That God told him that he would turn people from darkness to light. We have Paul writing in Colossians 1.13. That God has delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Peter saying in 1 Peter 2, 9, that God has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. See how the, the symbol is used so often. And I think perhaps the most powerful example of that, at least my favorite one, because Charles Wesley picked up on it in his song, And Can It Be?, uh, what we studied some time ago in our study of 2 Corinthians, 
that the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the glory of the gospel of God. And then in the sixth verse, God who said, let there be light, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the gospel of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Do you see how in all of these passages, not only is fire used for illumination, but in all of these passages, the actor is God, confirming the fact that God rushes on us. And these, the symbol of wind and fire is God acting on us. We do not initiate redemption. We are the receivers, the recipients of God's grace in redemption. Uh, could mention also, even the pagans knew this. Of course, St. Augustine said Plato was the closest to the truth of any of the Greek philosophers. But if you study Plato and you study the Republic, uh, he has uh, people in the cave, you know, in the darkness, and they're chained in the cave, and they, they just can't see anything. And I just they don't understand anything. And then they're able to, their chains are loosed. Um, well, they can see, first of all, they can see like a projector. They can see the images of people walking in the front of the cave projected by the fire on the back of the cave, like a movie. And then their heads are loosened and they can turn around and see the opening of the cave. They see men and animals walking around like that. And finally, at least one of them, can go out into the light. And it's only when you go into the light that you can have full enlightenment and knowledge. That's, of course, Plato, but the point is Darkness indicates ignorance. Light indicates understanding, even to the pagans. So the fire brings light. Secondly, fire brings warmth. Uh, and then I think the warmth here is not only a pleasant feeling of being warmed, but it is the idea of encouragement, it is the idea of motivation. Uh, warming you to, uh, to incite you to go forth and teach the gospel. You remember the story of John Wesley? Uh, John Wesley was converted intellectually, but felt no great passion for the preaching of the gospel. He went to Georgia, uh, and on the way over was in a storm, and there were some Moravian brethren on the ship with him who remained quite calm in the midst of a terrifying storm and were simply praying and singing psalms and Wesley was amazed. And they get to Georgia uh, and, and he preaches there uh, with no great consequences, comes back to America uh, and in London attends a meeting of the Moravian Brethren on Aldersgate Street and has an experience where he said, my heart was strangely warmed. The warming meant he now felt the passion. He felt the love. He was motivated as he was never before. So the idea of, of, of fire is also the idea of motivation. Elton Trueblood said, the fire of the Holy Spirit is so intense and so meaningful that they just cannot keep the message of the Spirit to themselves. So they speak of Jesus and fire spring up, and then a raging fire of revival. Jesus, remember, said, I will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And we see the fulfillment of it. Now, uh, if we look at verse 4, uh, we see that toward which it all points. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. All of them were filled. This is the baptism of the Spirit. Remember Pastor Jim saying, and we've talked about this before, that baptism is an inauguration. And I believe that is an excellent description. It is inauguration. So the baptism of the Spirit for these people on the day of Pentecost was an inauguration into the ministry of the Spirit, into the uh, full-orbed, uh, developed uh, church uh, that was now ready to take the gospel the uttermost parts of the earth. It was an, a, a baptism into that, a, an inauguration into that, but it was also a filling. Now there's a difference between baptism of spirit and filling the spirit. Um, to be filled with the spirit is to be fully, completely motivated, more than just initiated. 
I don't know that with us it might happen at the same time because the Spirit works in different ways with different people. Uh, we are all, according to Paul in 1 Corinthians 12, baptized by one Spirit into one body. But also, Paul says we should be filled with the Spirit. So they were both baptized with the Spirit and filled with the Spirit. And they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. We'll say the speaking in other tongues uh, is, is, of course, a miracle. But that isn't the end toward which it's pointing. The speaking in tongues just is an indication. And here's the word, attestation of God's presence and of the coming of the Spirit. An attestation of that fact. Uh, so when people make, other people in certain, in certain denominations feel ashamed that they cannot speak with tongues, they miss the point of it. Uh, the attestation was needed at this point. There comes a time when the attestation is no longer needed. And even the writer of Hebrews recognized that. Because Hebrews was written after the age of miracles subsided. I don't say God can't perform such a miracle today. He can. But the fact is it had a definite purpose at that time. And the writer of Hebrews looks back at Hebrews 2.1 and he says that it was attested to these apostles by signs, wonders, and, and miracles. Past tense, attested. So the time for attestation has ended. Um, and one commentator said, when the church grows to such a size, it's big enough, its very presence in the world is an attestation to the presence of the Spirit, and therefore the speaking in tongues are no longer needed. Um, to notice also one thing that we need to stop then, Spirit gave them utterance. That word for utterance is a word that is very seldom used in the New Testament. <laughs> it's a word I can't pronounce. Uh, I'll give it my best try. Apophilomai. Can you say a PH followed by a TH all together? That's what you've got there. Apophilomai. And it, it, the word means to investigate, to declare, to speak forth plainly, plainly. It indicates a motivation, a passion. The Spirit gave them this passion, this ability to speak. Not only the ability to speak, but the motivation to speak. And so they, they, they do so, and that's what's happened. Uh, and we'll their point, we will stop. Tower of Babel, Genesis 11. They sinned. God was displeased with what they were doing, exalting themselves and trying to build a tower to heaven. That's human pride. And he confused their languages. And they couldn't understand each other. This reverses the curse of the, of the Tower of Babel. They now are able to understand. We can understand. We'll see that next week. We can understand. Understanding replaced the confusion of the Babel. Father, we thank you for what you do. We stand amazed always at your redemption, your plan of redemption, your love for your people, what you do, what you continue to do. And we are so thankful indeed for the Holy Spirit that continues to live within us, dwell within us, guide us, fill us, enable us, motivate us. Bless us now as we enter into worship, and we pray we may worship in spirit and in truth. And we ask in Christ's name.